Good morning. We are at the Sheboygan County Historical Museum. It is the third Saturday in October, October 15th, 2011. And our theme for this month is Collectors of Sheboygan County and their collections. Um, we are, have a lot of interesting things in store for you as we um, take a look around today. We also have some questions for you. Um, we have a few mystery items that we are wondering if you can help us to solve. Um, one of the things is we have a picture of a place that we know um, that was taken in Sheboygan, but we are not quite sure of the establishment. So we're um, looking to see if you can help us with that. We also have a soda, um, Jack Jack that was um, produced in another state, but we had a distributor in Sheboygan and we don't know who the distributor was. So we're hoping that you can help us with some of those questions. We have a very, very nice collection of Sheboygan memorabilia businesses. Um, so you will see a lot of um, different things um, displayed in that display. We also have an interesting um, selection of um, different types of irons through the years. Um, we have a um, collection of valentines and uh, many of the valentines were um, given to a um, lady by her husband and actually some um, classmates as she was growing up. So that's kind of interesting also. We have um, some Wells Fargo um, information and we actually have a um, running display with that. So that should be interesting. Um, we also have some um, toy tractors and the toy tractors, um, you can get a lot of history with that because they have some um, that have been refurbished and some that are older. Um, many of the things that we have today decade, um, go through um, much of the um, 20th century. So it's, it'll be a very, very interesting display. We also have Sheboygan um, bar memorabilia that will be interesting to see some of the old bars and also some of the um, souvenirs that they handed out. And one of the um, things that has been requested many times is um, comics. And so we have a big selection also on comics. And then we um, have um, some Mark's cars from um, the past history too and we actually have an ambulance that is working so that should be fun to see also. So enjoy the day and enjoy um, seeing the selections that we have. Good morning. I'm Karen Huffshill and I'm here today at the Historical Museum to display my collection of vintage irons. Um, I would say probably about 15 years ago I started to have an interest in antiques and so I would go to antique stores and flea markets and um, I developed an interest in old irons. Um, when I was a young girl my mother used to make me iron that was my job and uh, my father would wear these white shirts and my mother never had time to iron so in those days she would sprinkle them, roll them up put them in a plastic bag and stick them in the freezer. And all of a sudden when it got there to be, there was too many shirts in the freezer or my father ran out of shirts, she'd say, Karen, it's time to iron. So I would have to take these shirts out of the freezer, let them unthaw, and then I would have to iron them. They were quite easy to iron because they were cold and the iron slid or glided over them but there was always wrinkles galore or the possibility that you would scorch the white shirt and it would then be yellow. So anyway, I really hated to iron, but for some reason I became fascinated with irons. So I have an assortment of various irons, um, you know, from the first uh, electrical irons and uh, in a display over here, they talk about the American Beauty uh, iron that you could buy. A uh, salesman actually came to your house and uh, sold these irons, and you could put them like on um, almost, it wasn't a credit card, but they would bill you monthly for your uh, payment. Uh, then we have here, we have the old iron box, where, which people use to uh, transport their irons. I particularly liked um, the irons that had this ball at the end. I was kind of fascinated by them. Uh, they put fuel in here and um, 
then they would adjust the heat by turning this knob back and forth here. The thing is, a lot of times these irons would explode because they became too hot or some of the liquid would leak and uh, you would end up getting them all over your clothing. Um, but I was fascinated with this type of uh, uh, iron. And then as we move over here, I also found this little child's um, ironing board. So then I was in the process of uh, seeking out uh, little irons for uh, children. And um, right here we have this little iron, um, which became a classic uh, iron. And uh, it actually works today. You just plug it in and, and can, you know, heat. Um, this was really more of a, a, a toy iron, you know, that uh, children would play with. And then over here I have another one that actually still works today too, where you plug it in and, um, and heat it up. So this is my display of irons, although I hated to iron, I, I love to collect them. I'm Dave Martini and I'm here today at the museum with my collection of uh, 1950s uh, cowboy and uh, TV and uh, TV and movie cowboy items, and I've been collecting this stuff since I was a kid. Several of these items were mine as a boy. Several I bought later on for auctions and things like that. The first item here is a Lionel train set. It's called the General Frontier Gift Pack. Around 1961 or thereabouts, Civil War was a very popular uh, subject on TV and there was a movie called The Great Locomotive Chase with Fess Parker where the Union Army goes down to the south and steals a Confederate train and takes it north and destroys the tracks and bridges. This is a model of that train set, the Western Atlantic, and the locomotive is called the General. Over here is another General locomotive, the old wood burner, that's a Lionel. Um, that's a newer one, but it's uh, based on the old original one. Over here is the official Tales of Wells Fargo playset and electric train. This was made by the Marks Toy Company. I'm going to turn it off a minute. The original box is back here. This was a show that was on TV and had Dale Robertson. He was Jim Hardy. He was the Wells Fargo agent. And the playset, you got the Wells Fargo headquarters building. You got the Western Town, you got a Wells Fargo stagecoach, you got cowboys that were shooting at bank, bank robbers, you had Indians, um, you got the whole Western Town, complete with spittoons in front of the tavern, lanterns, uh, uh, watering trough for the horses, a uh, box of Winchesters, hitching rails, everything you'd have in a Western Town. And of course, here's the stagecoach, and these are uh, yeah, Indian arrows and things I've never used. Okay. Over here is the Roy Rogers guitar. This I bought years ago and I never used it. But this is probably from around 1957, 58. Got the original box for it. Made in the United States. Roy Rogers uh, sold a lot of items, anything from uh, like here's a coloring book, Pat Brady, that was Roy Rogers' sidekick in Nellie Bell with a Jeep. And you could buy anything from Roy Rogers, uh, from cap guns, uh, uh, stagecoaches, uh, covered wagons, uh, anything Western related. Over here is my original lunchbox. This is a Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, what they call a dome top lunchbox. I carried this to school when I was a boy, so you can see it's kind of beat up. The bottom's really beat up because we used to play lunchbox slide. We'd slide our lunchboxes on the floor in the school and whosoever lunchbox went the furthest and didn't tip over, you could pick all your buddies and take like, like if you had a candy bar or something, you could take his candy bar. So this was a good lunchbox for that. Most of the guys had these square ones and these tipped over easier. So this was a pretty good lunchbox for, for playing that game. This is the thermos. This is not the original thermos. I broke my thermos when I was a kid. And this thermos I picked up at an auction years later. They're glass lined. The original thermoses are glass lined. 
So it's very common as a kid you drop your thermos and you break the glass. They marketed it. Here's a Roy Rogers puzzle. The puzzle next to it is Rin Tin Tin, which was another TV show at the time. There's a story about this dog and the boy. They were on a uh, old western outpost at the 7th Cavalry. That was a TV show that was on for a while. The next one is Joy and Fury, which I used to watch before I went to school in the morning. That was a boy and his horse. The horse was Fury, the black horse, and he lived on the Broken Wheel Ranch with his uncle. Uh, next one I got is a Gene Autry book. Gene Autry and the Golden Stallion. And Gene Autry, I don't have a lot of Gene Autry stuff because he was a little bit before my time. Uh, I was more Roy Rogers than that. Over here is a Davy Crockett pencil case. You could take, you used to carry to school. You put your pencils and your erasers and stuff in there. But this is actually a Walt Disney Davy Crockett. It's even got like, like the coonskin cap is like, like felt, like, like, like real fur or whatever. In the show, you now in the cabinets down here, are the complete Roy Rogers Western Town, Mineral City. You've got a saloon, you got the bank, you got the Wells Fargo office, the barbershop and post office. And all the furniture here would actually go inside the building. The buildings have interiors in them. So if you go behind the building, you can see there's like the wallpaper and the floor and everything, like in a real building. And all these pieces would be in the buildings. On the buckboard here is Roy Rogers. Um, there's another one over here. I got Dale Evans too, I can't remember where she is. But if you look down into here, matter of fact, maybe... Can you go down inside there or not? But all the figures are very authentic looking. Here's a guy in a bar fight. He's, he's be actually slugging another guy. This guy here is robbing the bank. He's riding off on his horse with his six-shooter drawn. He's got his bad, uh, bad man's mask on. And here's a guy getting ready to shoot him with his rifle. I mean, it's just, everything was based on the TV shows back then. You know, a lot of gunplay, you know. Then here we got a lady that's just working, walking down the street in the town. She was just coming back from the market. Then we got the old time milk wagon with a case of milk in it. You know, you have, everything was horse drawn back then. Now we come back to the other end here. Here's the Roy Rogers Ranch. And of course, the Roy Rogers uh, Westerns were kind of unique is that they had cars and stuff in them. And every Roy Rogers uh, movie had an old 19, like 39 or 40 Ford Woody, you know. And there's always some reason that Roy Rogers could catch one of those on his horse. The guy would get away in that car and he'd chase up on his horse and catch it, only in the movies, TV shows. Uh, but you can see we got the rodeo shoots, we got the corral, the fences, we got some longhorns. Everything you would need on a ranch. We got the anvil, the forge, the water pump, the ax, the wood pile, the water barrel. There's Dale Evans on the porch of the house and Bullets laying down sleeping there. He's laying on his side. And of course, here's Nellie Bell, the Jeep. That was Pat Brady's uh, transportation. Then if we go back to the end over here, which we missed. We missed the whole showcase over here. This upright showcase in back here, all the way around. On the top shelf is the official Iron Horse train set. Iron Horse uh, was a uh, TV show that only lasted like one season. It, st it's, it starred Dale Robertson, which was the same guy that still starred in Tales of Wells Fargo. But this show only lasted like about one season. It was a very difficult thing to find. I like the artwork in the box, with the Indians and the Cowboys shooting each other off the train. I don't think they could do that today. Uh, down here is the Roy Rogers uh, f uh, Fix-It Chuck Wagon and Nellie Bell Jeep. Um, there was a little wrench, you could take the tires off of the, the wheels, you could take the wheels off of the truck wagon and like do maintenance on it. You could take the wheels off the Jeep and you had the tools, you had a little axe or a little hammer, you got the jack stands, you know, so you could actually take it, it was made to be taken apart and put back together. Then you had a strong box, you had a trunk, the water, some gold bullion. On the bottom here are my six shooters. Um, you can see that you know, they're pretty authentic in those days. Um, here's the holster, the gun belt, and there's actually uh, plastic bullets in the gun belt. And the six shooters were all pot metal, were metal. In the middle of there is what's called the ranch phone. 
So old time phone, you turn a crank or ring, and then there's a crank down below, it had a little record inside. It would say, hello Central, what ranch do you want to get? Uh, please ring, I'll dial that number for you. And it still works. But it hello, my name is Tom Breer. I've been collecting farm tractors and implements for about 25 years. Some of these here, the combine and the manure spreader, this tractor, the disc, were mine when I was young. They have been refurbished. That, when, when you started becoming a collector? Yeah, the true scale set. When did they start putting people on the tractors? Well, they started back putting tractors on way back in the uh, 30s, 40s. Arcade was uh, one of the first, I believe, that, that put uh, track or guys on the tractors. They were usually a nickel plated or aluminum. Can you tell about the one that he's right now? That one there? Yep. Uh, that supposedly is the world's uh, biggest tractor. <laughs> it comes from out, either in Montana or, or South Dakota where it was built. And the two on the end there, there. One shows the way I bought it, and this one here, after it was restored. Who, who restores them? The collector, or do you take it to a? Place? I have, a, I have somebody that does my, my restoring. The pictures on the wall already came originally from, the old Ford garage in Howard's Grove. My dad found them. He must have been exploring downstairs as they were tearing the building, the building down. And I ended up with them. <laughs> okay, my name is John Brown and I'm from Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. And I guess I'm 85 years old, so I'm in my second childhood. And I've collected toys and trains from way back in 1938. And some of these toys I had as a youngster, and I was here uh, in April presenting my Tootsie toys and I brought a couple of these along and they said, well, how about setting up uh, here in October and bring your Marx stuff? So that's what I did. I'm bringing a Marx, a Marx toys. And Marx is, you know, is over on your uh, big displays that you got in the back over there. There's a Marx tractor and so forth, same one that's in here. Sold for 83 cents, I see those days. Well, this first one here was a police car that I had as a child, and uh, you can wind this up, and uh, it'll run around. And also, if you put a battery in, the lights burn. Has a little switch on the side, has a little break in the back. And my father, one day, he got kind of disgusted with me playing with his toy, and he was reading the newspaper, and he says, "Bring that toy over here." So I brought it over, and he turned it upside down, and he took the siren out of it. And I can show you that. This car had a siren in the back. And my father couldn't stand the noise anymore, so he tore this thing out of there. But I had another one. 
And that was this ambulance that I'd gotten a couple years later. It has the same motor and everything, but this one has a siren. So, yeah, I wasn't going to let him get cold as close to this one. And just to, again, to give you an idea uh, what it sounds like, I'll wind this up and you can see why he took the siren off of the last one. So as a kid, I would run these. Now, if you listen, this baby is really going to whirl. So as a kid, running that toy all the time drove him crazy. <laughs> but this was also mine as, as a kid. So the other one, I found a car in Florida one time at an antiques show, and it was just like my police car, except this one was fire department. And I thought, boy, that's, that's kind of neat. So I bought that one. And then later on, I found an earlier Marks, or even earlier than the one I had here. And this one was probably about 1931. This was about 1934. And that was one of their first ones. However, Marks bought, bought out another company. And this truck, and this is not the one I had as a kid, but it is a similar truck. And this truck, on the wheels, it says Gerard. Well, the first Marx cars like this had some Gerard on them also. So the Gerard company was bought out by Marx. So the first ones that they made still had Gerard on them. They have this car you can get with Gerard or you can get it as Marx. Then the rest of them he started calling for marks. So I've got one of the Gerards because that was the company they started with. Then uh, I've got over here Caterpillar tractors. And, and the Caterpillar tractors, I've got the oldest one and then they get newer as you go along the line. And really the scarcest one of this group and the one you cannot very seldom cannot find and that's this little one and this little tractor sold for a quarter and i've had one of these as a as a kid but they didn't last very long they're real cheap and you only ran them three four times and they quit so there aren't any of these that you find around well, this one still operates. And so, very unusual little tractor because none of them are survived and none of them operate if they did survive. So, I found this one also in Florida at a flea market and I was real happy to get hold of that. Uh, this one uh, cranks from the rear and uh, the other ones crank from the side. Now notice some of their older tractors, like this is really quite beat, but it has the original patent on the back. And when they first sold them, they had a patent on it and everything written on, on the back of their tractor. Then as they started to upgrade, they didn't list those anymore. But this is kind of a rustic old thing, but it still does run. So, so I picked this one up just because it's very old. Oops, tip over some trains here. Then this one here, I also had as a youngster. This was my tractor. And uh, I got this about 1938. And then uh, just about World War II, they upgraded this tractor and put a fancier front on it. This one has a straight front, this one has a curved one. And this one here was in the 1950s and 60s, so this is our latest one. They're basically uh, the same tractor, and this one that shows the, the side of the motor on here is molded right into the plastic. Now when Marks did, 
they came out with this new one. However, if you look at it right, the old motor is still, can you see that? I'll take it out of here once. The old exhaust is still molded onto the car. So they used the same body, and Marx was good at that, using things over and over. So they moved the same body, but they just painted it different. And then instead of having metal wheels, it has plastic wheels. So you think it's a new tractor, but it's basically the old original one from the silver one that they had. Now, this was my car, and I bought this in World War II, and I got the original box yet, and it's called Tricky Taxi, and what it does, it never runs off the table, because as it runs, it has a little wheel that turns sideways. So as the car gets to the end, it'll turn and never run off the table. So they made Trixie taxis before the war. This was the last one, the black and white one. So these go back into about 38, 38, 39, 40, all the way up to the war. And this was a one that was made about 1941. And so I've picked up, I, I have one that I don't have yet, but I've been looking for them. And when I do find them, I, I pick one of these up. So. Now the reason I brought this along, this was a train, Marx train I had from uh, 19, 1938 and uh, it's an old Commodore Vanderbilt and it had a lot of miles as you can see by the grooves in the, in the center. But Marx made this engine and it sold at the dime stores Kreskis and Woolworths and so forth for one dollar. Then the tender you had to buy separate and this one sold for ten cents. So all the cars that went with the Mark train all sold for ten cents. So that was quite a bargain. Now after the war Marx did go into HO. Most people don't know that. So this is part of an HO train set and if you look at the caboose, for example, uh, you said this is rock on the caboose, but in the center, and I don't know if that will show, but there is a Marx symbol. And so if you look, it's a round thing with an X in it. So Marx did make HO trains, and particularly their old steam engine. Yeah, it's quite an engine, and uh, so Marx did make did make trains. I brought this just because not not many people know that uh, Marx went into the train business, but they didn't stay in it too long. Now there's only one other thing here. This is a German-made tractor, and this is only about 20 years old. But I bought it because you wind this tractor up by the wheel and put the key in, in here. And you wind it up and then you can shift it to first, second, third and fourth gear and it'll run at a different speed. When you put it in first it runs real slow, second a little more and you can put it up. Then it has also a reverse so you can put it in reverse. So it really does that. So I brought that as kind of a novelty. So this one over here is a Marx train from 19, and a lot of people don't know that, but this train is a model of the M10,000. And the M10,000 was the first streamliner in the United States. And it was made by Union, and Union Pacific was, uh, was a railroad and you can see on the side and there's very very few of these and I am the only one I've actually seen uh, so Marx made this when the when the company came out with a first streamliner and they took this all over the United States 
and all the big cities for one year they just toured with that with that train and so I brought them out of that because Mark's of all things made a little toy of that uh, first streamliner well it gives you a little bit of a cover of some of the things I've got here so. Hi, I'm Candace Schmidt, and I'm daughter to Herb and Laura Schmidt, and my dad had owned the uh, Schmidt Standard Service Station on 8th in Huron, and I brought a few mementos of his service station and also of other gasoline service stations from the 50s and 60s. And what I have here is it had been um, a photo album, and you, any of your pit, vacation pictures, you would put in the photo album, and that is something that my dad had passed out. And also then we have here, this had been in the Sheboygan Press in 1953, and it lists all the Gasoline Dealers Association members in Sheboygan, and it has pictures of them and where their service station had been located. And like I said, that had been in the Sheboygan Press in 1953, and it was actually a newspaper, and the service stations would put it in their window. So this is just a copy of what it was. And some of these service stations are still in existence. Some are just empty buildings or whatever. And then here I have a picture of my mom and my dad. This my dad, Irv Schmidt. He became the, uh, uh, he was a board member for the Gasoline Dealers Association and also president of the Gasoline Dealers Association. And this is just a write up from 1968 and uh, when he was first elected. This here picture is from the 1940s, shortly after the war. Um, I know that because my uncle Hank. Tusky came back from the war and my dad asked him if he would come and work for him for a little while and this like I said earlier this station is on Athian Huron um, it's no longer in existence the building is still there um, right across from Holy Name Church um, and so anyway my brother John who is now 70 is here the little guy right there and he would, he, John would pump gas and wash windows and check the oil and everything else. It was a full service, of course, back then. I remember growing up and my dad talking about the gas wars and gasoline back then was like five cents a gallon or something like that. And he'd get so upset because another guy um, might have raised his gasoline higher or low, lower. And uh, this here picture is from 1955. And back then, um, my dad would have tires delivered and they would be put in the front of the service station. And then after they were all delivered, he'd bring them home. We lived on North 20th Street and would put them in the basement. And whenever um, a customer needed tires or one tire or four tires, dad would come home, get a tire from the basement that matched the right size and would bring it back to the service station because he'd have hundreds of them delivered, so there wasn't enough room right there to keep them. And that's Dad and, and myself. Um, this is from the, um, 1952, in front of the service station, where my dad was holding me. That's me, with the big bonnet on back then. We had those, those big sun bonnets. And this is my mom, Laura Schmidt. And uh, that's my dad's pickup truck. And it says Schmidt Standard Service right there. And that was my dad's business card. And then also, here's a, a receipt. And this gentleman was a Max Pittner who lived on North 29th Street. And it's dated August of 1961. And back then, uh, Max Pittner, for only $15.10, had almost eight gallons of gasoline put in his car, had an oil lube filter, air filter, and a full service check um, for only $15.10, all of that. And so this is just a receipt that um, my dad had, and I kept it. And uh, 
this is just like an invoice, and then they would just pay him later. They didn't have to pay him right away. Um, and sometimes my mom would do the billing. She'd come into the service station, um, sit at the desk. She would send out the bills to people, and then that's how they would bill them. Charge cards weren't really all that popular there. And uh, when I was little, I would lick the stamps and put them on the envelope, and then my dad would give me a little bottle of root beer out of, the, uh, out of the, this red thing where the soda was in. And also my dad, he would give out keychains. This is a li little melted, but this was a keychain, and it said, who gives a hoot? We do, Schmidt Standard Service. And then he also gave out pencils, Schmidt Standard Service and also playing cards. And then this is just a calendar from Dick Heyer's service station. He's on uh, 9th and Erie. And this calendar was from 1991, and I saved it. And it just has pictures of the uh, old history of the old service stations throughout the United States. And because Standard Oil also became Amoco, Sunoco, depending upon what region you were in the United States, they had different names for it. And also, not part of um, Irv Schmidt's Schmidt Standard Service, but I had collected this um, when I was in Connecticut, and uh, I found I ran across this in a um, in an antique shop, and I bought it and. I don't know the date of it, it was back from the 1920s maybe, 1910s, and this is when cars did not have a gas gauge inside, so you had to use a measuring stick to put it into the tank of the gas, gasoline tank, to see how much gasoline you were going to be needing, so they didn't overflow. So this is the measuring stick, and you can see it says Sonoco of Standard, so Standard Oil was also Amoco and you know the Rockefeller Flagger history of that and then on the other side it says here also Sunoco Motors and so forth New York on Broadway Avenue so this is just something I picked up when I lived in Connecticut um, possibly the 1910s 1920s so that's the history of Irv Schmidt's Schmidt Standard Service on 8th and Huron. These hats are from the collection of Carol Schmidt from um, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, she has had fun, just having fun with hats throughout the years. Um, she has quite a few different kinds in her collections. Um, you can see a number of um, hats that she has that have feathers on. You can see some of the pillbox um, hats. You can see some um, straw hats. Um, the, there's a pink hat that is actually from um, England. Um, and then in front, she has a um, very thin hat that just has a band and has a lot of netting. And she calls that her wedding hat. Um, she was very unhappy that her favorite hat has um, disappeared. When she was on vacation in San Francisco, they left it in a rental car. So she's trying to get that hat back. But you can see that she has quite a collection. Um, some have bands on that would have been worn on underneath on the chin. And um, there's velvet ones, there's felt ones, um, there's silk ones. So she has quite a collection. This is the comic collection of Augie Margano. He was not able to be here today, uh, but many of his comics span um, quite a bit of the um, 20th century. Um, he has quite a few of, um, over here we have um, Roy Rogers and we have um, little um, Lulu, um, Red Rover, and um, then he also has some about Betty Bailey and um, quite a few of the Western ones, um, Roy Rogers, and um, then he has quite a few of the Looney Tunes, um, Tarzan, um, Gene Autry, um, Tom Mix, um, 
So he has quite a few that he has collected over the years. He has a few um, newspaper ones, um, one from the Comic Weekly and one from the Chicago um, American Comic Pictorial. Um, so he has collected quite a few um, throughout the years. He also has um, a number of um, resource books for comics um, that we have on our round table that we will show you later on. Hi, I'm Phyllis Smith and we're here at the County Museum. And in this room is about 25 years worth of collection that I have done of any kind of advertising item of a business that once was in business here in the city of Sheboygan. Not the county, but the city of Sheboygan. I do not collect a specific type of article. It can be anything from a matchbook to a letter opener to a crock, uh, a sign, bottles, any kind of a thing, so long as it tells me of a business that was here sometime, old, modern, new, in business, out of business, uh, the best way to determine how old a business is, on this woodworking apron, the phone number is 1063W. I have some items that have phone numbers that are only three digits. When they get up into the four digits or the five, the, the seven, they're getting newer. This one, the maple shop is a GL8. G and L are four and five on the phone dial. So this is a little more recent, probably in the 60s, 50s, 60s maybe. But I collect anything and everything, paper, cardboard, old signs, um, Pine Hills Golden Corn. Now that's Pine Hills is not in the city of Sheboygan, but the little line at the bottom says Schultz Brothers. Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And another thing, when they put Sheboygan W-I-S, that tells me it's a newer or older item than if it was W-I. Here we have a crock from Art Schmidt, phone 780. 305. Here's newer, 1378. I have bottles from Crystal Springs, Hinsey's Candies, yum yum, Keitel's Candies, more yum yum, all kinds of pens and uh, tickets, checks, blotters, box drugs. This is Huffman's Flowerland, which is now Cons out on the double E. Enzo gel and these shoes and I don't know if you can pick that up let me hold this one can you pick that up it says it's printed in there HC Prangy Company Sheboygan Wisconsin it's a high heel shoe and then they put out a little commemorative Compliments of the Prangies Big Department Store. That is what Prangies used to be known as. If somebody said, oh, the Big Department Store, they knew it was Prangies. It's a little top. Over here we have several crates. I have a Kool-Aid. Um, nowadays Kool-Aid is in powder form. In those days it was a soda pop locally distributed. Spiller Spring duffel bag. Sheboygan Dry Goods. Sheboygan Dry Goods was across the street from H.C. Prangy Company. 
They were another department store, held just about everything. The Sheboygan Baking Company Golden Crust Bread Metal Box. I do not know where that came from, but I know that it was Sheboygan. I don't know the street address. And then there's Schultz Brothers. They're still going fine. That's a banana box. In the fall of the year, the banana boat would come in. They'd bring in the bananas and the fresh fruit. Now we just go to our grocery store and buy bananas and fresh fruit. Those days it only came in once or twice, and that was the only time that you would have fresh fruit and bananas, some stuff that you didn't grow around here. Over here we have a board of different years and different businesses' calendars, all kinds of calendars and uh, wooden hangers. This little hanger is also from the big store, H.C. Prangy. That's for hanging a child's or an infant's garment on it. That's why it's so small. We've got a, a yardstick from Ram's Funeral Home. And we have more b the crates here from various uh, breweries. Miller, uh, mineral water, Shriers. Over on the other table, I'll talk about their bottles. This, let me take this away. This is a Prangy's folding box. If you ordered your groceries there but couldn't take them home because maybe you were invalid they would put your groceries in these boxes deliver it to your home and i was just recently told not only did they deliver to your home they would bring it into your house take the food out of the uh, the box and put it in your house where you wanted it and then fold up the box and go back to prangies that's what i call service this is a picture, I don't know how well you can zoom in on it, of the H.C. Prangy store. We feel that it's about 1927. It's going to be hard to see, but there are some vehicles here, and they look like they're Model Ts. Over here we have a collection of soda bottles. This is Springtime, Lake Breeze, uh, Kool-Aid again. This is uh, somebody by the name of Barney Grassy, West Side Dairy. Uh, there's a few Shriers. This is when it was beer. This is when it was soda. Various eyeglasses from Rudnick's and Imic. A.F. Rust, Dry Goods, Sheboygan Oat King, Sheboygan uh, Coal, and Arts Tavern, Art Jewel Furniture, Avenue Exchange, and everybody's favorite, Steve, if you'll come back, Don McNeil. Everybody knows Don McNeil and his breakfast club. On the wall here is a large poster of the Poloware company, their enamelware. I have some of their enamelware and some Valrath enamel. And then because a month or so back, it was the 100th anniversary of Very Fine. I brought the paper and some glasses, and the glasses celebrate the 75th anniversary. This is a crock from Triangle Grocery, which later on became Miesfeld's, and then Miesfeld's moved out. I have a phone book from 1943, which the February of that year was a very good month, and March 30th. 
And this is a monopoly game of the various businesses of Sheboygan. This is only a part of my collection. Uh, my name is Fred Zimmer, and uh, I collect tin types. Uh, tin types started around 1830, uh, and all the way up to about 1850, they started getting painted with uh, color. Uh, tin type actually is on iron. Uh, it's a photo that is hand painted, very similar to a painting, and they really are considered in the sense of painting. The one you're looking at right now has the twins, and the twins are, is one um, um, photo, and then somehow the artist, the photographer, uh, reduced the dog through photography on the same plate. And then after the, that was finished, those two photos, he hand painted it, and then he painted the flower composition on top of that. This is a very a rare tin type, actually. Not many were done with a double photo on them uh, as such. Um, we come to the next tin type with the gold frame. The frame was found in Sheboygan. It's an early, actually very beautiful frame uh, from probably the 1860s, 1870s. Um, the lady is from Indiana. Uh, that's an early tin type. I have a time uh, dated a 1860, it could be even earlier. Again, this hand painted, uh, it's an early pioneer lady. I just love the piece because of what it is being so early with a pioneer lady. Uh, the one down here in the corner um, is even earlier than the previous one, which comes to around 1850 probably, 1860, and it, you'd know that by the style of frame and the, the hair style and clothes. That's how most of these are dated, uh, is through the clothing. Um, you're, where are we now? <laughs> Uh, the lady, the lady is, is was found in oh, the lady was found in uh, Manitowoc. Um, looks just like my sister-in-law, and my nephew's trying to get it out of me because it is a dead ringer. Um, again, it's uh, lightly hand painted. Uh, the one to the right, can you get the one with the triangle? And uh, that is a very uh, nice piece because it's in a triangular frame. It's so unusual. Um, those two are probably about 1870, uh, 1880, uh, for, for as far as time. My name is Scott Levendusky, and I have a collection of different tavern items, mainly bar tokens. And the reason I started collecting the bar tokens is that I'm working on a book on Sheboygan bars and taverns, and I'm using a lot of the bar tokens to illustrate in the book to show that the tavern was in existence other than just the name. And there are very few pictures of many of these taverns, so other than some newspaper ads, the only thing that you can find for some of these taverns are the tokens. And earlier taverns had metal tokens. Now just about every tavern has plastic of some color. Most of them are round or square. A uh, couple taverns do have wood nickels or wood tokens, commonly called wooden nickels, and I have some of those in this book also. And tokens are all pretty much the same size now. Earlier they used to be different sizes depending on the amount. Uh, sometimes the tokens that were good for a nickel or 10 cents were smaller than 25 cent ones. Hello, my name is Darla Jean Krause. I live in Random Lake and I'm displaying my mother's valentines. My mom was is Laverne Greenewald Wilkie. She grew up in Random Lake and she went to school in Silver Creek. The valentine collection is uh, from her school years. This one was uh, sent in 1942. My grandmother wrote on, on the back of every one of them. They have, a lot of them have moving parts. This guy winks. Um, my aunt, my, my grandma wrote this one out at, to my mom from my aunt in 1938 where my mom would be five years old and my aunt would be three. 
my dad gave this valentine to my mom and it says um, I'd like you to picture you as my valentine it's from Laverne G from Howard Wilkie and it was given in 1937 they uh, would have been seven and eight at the time um, they are now married 62 years all these valentines are from school people or from cousins a lot of the names we recognize that there's still people that live in the area as you can see some have um, little bump outs of, of little foam things that pull out some are handmade um, there's also personal letters in this collection so it's a really neat remembrance especially with my grandmother writing on all the cards thanks